Um, I always forget to do this, so I want to let you know that everything we do is on Facebook. Um, all of our films, all our personal life, I don't know. But anyway, please look uh, for our projects there, and do follow those projects that you uh, find are interesting, because we continually uh, discuss those topics online. Uh, we're very grateful to James for inviting us here today and to be part of this uh, event. Um, I sent Jane an email saying, what, what were you thinking? And, and that might have been an inartful way of asking the question, but I just wanted to know how she thought uh, we would uh, best fit into the, uh, the program today. And as I thought about it, um, I also noticed on the agenda that there's a symposium later today that's called, Is Symposium Day Worth It? Uh, student led this debate on the day's value. So uh, then I wondered um, about our own films in some ways. How do we know if, in making the film, does it do any good? Uh, have we, in fact, uh, delivered a message that's useful and that has some value? And, uh, and I wondered how we would even evaluate that in some ways. Although we do get some feedback, uh, sometimes uh, you wonder about those things. And then I remembered a portion of an interview that we did for the Iowa series, uh, parts two and three, with our friend Ruben Ironhorse Kent. And I went back and looked at that interview because it's not something that's part of the films, but he said this about justice. We were talking about, in particular, um, a traditional way in which the Iowa resolved conflicts. And after he had explained this to me, he said, um, justice, I love that word. It sounds so fair, but it's so hard to explain. What is justice? How does that work? So again, it was part of this interview, but uh, he was asking these questions uh, kind of in the same way that, that I, I've been asking these questions as we've been preparing for this opportunity. In 2008, uh, as we were releasing the DVD for the first Iowa film, we were honored with a traditional uh, naming ceremony during the Iowa Powwow in Kansas. And we were, uh, in a traditional way, presented to the ancestors, and we were given Iowa names. We have the same Iowa name. Uh, I have the male version, and Tammy has the, the female version. And my name is Wagi Che, and Tammy's name is Wagi Che Mi. And the name means, speaks for them. Now, one does not get to choose the name that one is given. But I felt a little uncomfortable with that name, because I thought the last thing that the Iowa people need are two white people speaking for them. And uh, it was only within the last year or two uh, that the elder who gave us that name, just in the course of a conversation about something else, said that the them, in speaks for them, he said, does not refer to contemporary Iowa people. He said it refers to their ancestors, those who are, who are gone, those who no longer have a voice. And so uh, then I felt a little bit more comfortable. Um, in all cases with our documentaries, it's always a tremendous opportunity that we have to tell uh, a story, but also a tremendous uh, responsibility that we feel. So how did we get started doing this? Um, in 1989, we moved to uh, Los Angeles, and uh, shortly thereafter, I was working for Sony Pictures. Has anyone seen Sony Pictures in the news lately? <laughs> Not so happy about that. Um, but after being there for two or three years, I realized that if I was honest with myself, and I was working in international distribution and marketing, there were only two or three pictures that the studios made in the course of a year out of dozens of films that I even was proud to be associated with in any way. So that's when we started talking about producing something uh, independently. And for some reason, we never thought about doing a narrative film or, or a dramatic film. We decided to do a documentary. And uh, has anyone heard of the 1912 Villisca, Iowa axe murders? Anyone? A handful of you. Well, that story, um, is about a family of six and two visiting children who were murdered with an ax while they slept in the little town of Villisca, Iowa, which is in southwest Iowa. 
Uh, we felt that the topic would be, we found the story very interesting, and we began doing that research and doing that production in 1993. But the project, because it was very expensive, we were shooting on film, uh, it was our first project, and it ended up extending over a decade. In other words, we started in 1994, and the film premiered on the 10th of June, the anniversary of the murders, in 2004. But that film kind of defined who we are as, as filmmakers, because in the beginning, we titled the film, the working title was just Villisca. It was the name of the town. But as we did the research and uh, looked into it, uh, we began to see a, whole, a lot of other layers to the story. And in the end, we had to add a subtitle. And that subtitle was Living with a Mystery. Because the situation that we observed in Villisca was that the repercussions of that murder that happened uh, now over 100 years ago are still present in the community today. So the story was uh, a search for justice. Uh, it was a small town split along economic and social lines. And uh, in the end, we thought we could exon both exonerate people who were wrongly accused of the murder, and we thought we could also shed light on why that community remains sort of conflicted even today about how to recognize that well-known event in their community's history. We're going to, uh, we have these clips that we're going to roll in as we talk today, and that we're hoping that everything runs smoothly, but please bear with us if we don't. Tammy has uh, done the heavy lifting on preparing the presentation today, and left it to, to me to deliver it, and she's gonna make sure the clips roll as they should, we hope. So we're going to try this, this, this showing this first clip. One of the surprises that came to us uh, doing, in doing the research was discovering that Villisco had been following the murders what's called a sundown town. Does anyone know what that is? Yes? Uh, that's where our national heritage Correct. Uh, and typically non-white individuals, sometimes specifically African Americans, are not allowed to spend the night in a community. They might do business during the day, but then they have to be gone by sunset. This was all due to him when he was running for re-election to the state senate. A story broke in the Kansas City Post that the Villisca Axe murders had been solved. The story also implied that a prominent Villisca resident had hired Blackie Mansfield to kill Joe Moore. But who was Blackie Mansfield? Villiscans had never heard of him. His first wife and daughter had been killed by an axe murder uh, two years after the Villisca murder in Blue Island, Illinois. As a young man who had been sent to Leavenworth Penitentiary for deserting the army, uh, he was thought to be a cocaine addict, according to Wilkerson. Wilkerson called him Blackie Mansfield. Now, Blackie Mansfield didn't even know that was his name. He never heard the name Blackie attached to him. That was attached to Jack Boyle. He wrote the Boston Blackie stories. He was a screenwriter, a dope addict. He had quite a colorful career. But Boyle was an ace telegrapher and, quote, famous reporter for the Kansas City Post. With Wilkerson's help, Boyle penned the Kansas City Post article. Wilkerson alleged that Mansfield had worked on a Villisca street dating crew in 1911, that he'd been hired by Jones at that time, and that he returned a year later to commit the crime. Mansfield was working in a Kansas City, Kansas meatpacking house when he was arrested by Wilkerson and local authorities in June of 1916. They urged him to confess by taking him to a bridge where they held him by his ankles over the Kansas River. Mansfield's denials bought him a ticket to the Montgomery County Jail where he was held pending an investigation by a grand jury. The newspaper's nickname for Mansfield set off a rumor that can still be found among older people, that he was in fact, black. After that, we didn't allow a, a dark person to stay all night in Villisca. And before that time, there were colored people living here, a few families. But after that, they were not allowed to live here. How long did you not allow people to? Oh, years, just years. So in July of 16, Wilkerson brought William Mansfield, whom he called Blackie, in front of the grand jury. Everyone, the citizens, believed that he was going to be indicted as the killer who was hired by Jones Money to do it. 
The grand jury met for three, four days, and they returned no true bill. They let him go. The grand jury proceedings are secret, of course, so nobody knew. There was at least one man on the grand jury who was directly associated. Okay. Um, so in the course of making this first documentary, uh, we realized that what we had an interest in was uh, topics that had a local or regional following, but that deserved a much wider audience. One of the storytelling techniques that we developed also during this first film involved uh, intercutting the historical sections with contemporary stories. So there was a bit of movement back and forth in time as we went through the storytelling uh, process. We also felt that uh, that helped people understand how this story from history was connected to them now. And that people don't really care about history unless they see that connection. Otherwise, it just seems like information that's not uh, that, uh, relevant. And also, for Tammy and I, we have to choose and deal with topics that we uh, are interested in sticking with because we market our product uh, in the long term, uh, indefinitely. And so uh, I often say that we, we don't date our subjects, we marry them. And that's really the, the case. Uh, we also, I don't think, uh, are sort of overtly uh, activist uh, filmmakers. And there are certainly some good films and some good filmmakers who, who take that approach. But I hope that, uh, we both hope that the films that we make and the subjects that we deal with and the messages within those films are uh, obvious or at least uh, accessible to the audience. One of the films that we saw early on that was of this activist type uh, was a film by Errol Morris. It was one of his early films called The Thin Blue Line. Has anyone seen that film? Um, a very powerful film. It was a controversial film at the time because they, he employed the use of reenactments, which in itself isn't controversial. We've certainly done that as well. But he in fact reenacted testimony about things that we learn as we go through the film didn't actually happen. And so there was a debate in the documentary community about was this ethical, you know, and all of that sort of thing. So um, it was a very effective uh, storytelling tool, however. And the film was about a man who uh, was wrongly convicted of murder uh, in Texas. Uh, literally had a murder pinned on him by the criminal justice system in that state. And he had uh, been serving, I think, almost a dozen years uh, for a murder, a murder conviction and was released, actually, as a result of the film. Uh, Tammy and I were in an audience uh, with Errol Morris uh, in Los Angeles screening uh, his film, um, The Fog of War, and uh, he was asked about that, and he commented on it, because someone had said, well, that was great filmmaking, you know, that you made this film and uh, this man was exonerated. And he said it wasn't great filmmaking. He said it was, it was great investigation, uh, a great investigation that we undertook. Um, to, to get to the bottom of the story. Um, so while we aren't perhaps as obvious as Errol Morris might be or others in, in their documentaries about the message that we're sending, uh, we, we do hope that our films do have a message. And it reminded me of something, there was a critic or a reporter that asked Alfred Hitchcock one time, um, he said, what's the deepest logic of your films, sir? And Hitchcock replied, to put the audience through it. And I think that uh, was it down very clearly uh, from our perspective as filmmakers. From the Villisca film, we went to our second film, which was called Lost Nation, the Highway. Um, I grew up here in the Quad Cities on the Illinois side, uh, so maybe I had an excuse for not knowing who the Highway were, but Annie was born in Waterloo, uh, Iowa, and educated in Iowa schools, but had never heard anything about the people whose uh, name the state bears. So we realized right away this was a good uh, subject and a very interesting story. But I'm going to read the synopsis because in many ways the synopsis has uh, the themes that uh, are adequate for every, um, uh, for the series. But Actually, I'm going to read the synopsis. <laughs> in 1824, in the twilight of Native American dominion, Two conflicted leaders met with William Clark to sign a momentous treaty. White Cloud saw cooperation as survival for his people, while Great Walker regretted the loss of their ancestral homeland. This pivotal moment led both men to different tragic destinies. 
in their battle with epic change. I am Wade Elder to join historians and archaeologists to tell the dramatic true story of the small tribe that once claimed the territory between the Missouri and Mississippi rivers from Pipestone, Minnesota to St. Louis. What was a quest for survival in the past has become a struggle to retain a unique Native American culture and language in the present. Now the Iowa films, probably more than any other film we've done, even uh, to date, has changed our lives uh, in many ways. And um, that first film, we were still living in Los Angeles and traveling back here, so over two years we logged about 20,000 uh, highway miles in the production of the film. We moved back here in 2007, uh, just about uh, eight years ago, and uh, edited and finished the film after we moved here. But once it was complete and we began showing it, um, it hit a fairly big target. We realized that the Iowa people were pleased with the film and enjoyed the film. Uh, the scholars that we worked with uh, on the film uh, felt it was a, a, a fair telling of the story. And we were getting a nice uh, portion of the general public. Our, our audience is generally the PBS uh, demographic, and we went a bit beyond that, so we were pretty pleased. Most importantly, perhaps, both Iowa and non-Iowa Native people said to us in various ways that they felt that the, that the film was giving a voice uh, to them and that Native voices were being heard in a way that sometimes they may not be heard in other films about uh, Native people. A tremendous uh, compliment and we, we appreciated the opportunity to, to help them tell their story. That, that first film led to questions of, because it covered a period between uh, 1700 and 1837, but what happened after that? And so we developed two sequels, uh, Iowa 2, which covered 1837, when the Iowa and all uh, Native people were removed officially from the state of Iowa. Uh, the Iowa were placed on a reservation in Kansas. Uh, through 1878, when there was a split in the tribe, it became two tribes, uh, one in Kansas and one in Oklahoma. So in Iowa 3, we pick up the story in 1878, and we take their story up through about the 1970s, which would be uh, the, the uh, period of the American Indian Movement. We're going to play a clip from Iowa 3, and uh, this section is called Time and Tide, and we're going to attempt to, or do we skip a little part of this? Okay, so a little technical thing there, hopefully that will work. Iowa 3. The spirits of the dead would come back and that the old times would be restored, that the buffalo would come back. People flocked to this new prophecy. While I always composed their own Mostad songs, they also used uh, some songs uh, based upon the Pawnee songs that they learned since the Pawnees were their mentors, you know. We should be able to have a definition to differentiate between battle and massacre. And if it's a massacre, call it a massacre. And It's the most in any one encounter in U.S. history. So that is an issue that a lot of people want to uh, address, like resend those medals of honor.
it was that next generation that didn't need those that allows them. Immigrants, bad immigrants, 
of course the people who were just like you were the good immigrants. And with the higher number of uh, Southern and Eastern Europeans, it was also a change in terms of what schooling was expected to be. Americanization, civic responsibility uh, became important. There was a certain amount of difficulty with the new immigrant situations, but they all, the children, all ended up attending the same school. So uh, it, it brought them all together that way, I think. Sometimes they did not speak English. And a relative in Kasuth County, he, he was of German background, and he said that what the school board did, and of course the school board were primarily German Americans, they would hire a teacher who could speak German and English. Because many of the children, starting out, simply couldn't speak English. First day I went to school, the half of the schoolyard was thick foam thickets with big stickers on. And Dad brought me to school and dumped me off. And I had my mind made up where I was going to this damn place. So I crawled from hands and knees into the plum thicket and uh, time for school. And the big boys couldn't get in the thicket to get me out and the small guys couldn't pull me out. So the teacher had to call the school director and he called several neighbors and they chopped the plum trees all down. I was holding out pretty good. I got to school about 10.30 that morning. And the teacher didn't have a sense of humor whatsoever. He pumped my little butt down and said, what's the law going to be here? Furthermore, the first day of school, I could talk very, very little English. And I was told what we're going to talk around here, and that's that. By 1900 in Wisconsin, we had 50 different ethnic groups that had settled here. Earlier I mentioned that the New Yorkers and some of the New England people had come here first, followed by the Germans and the Norwegians and the Poles and the Swedes and the Irish, and on to 50, every one of those ethnic groups saw education as a way for them to make it in this country. And the home community where I grew up had, had Polish people, Norwegian people, English people, German people, Welsh people, all in the same community, all committed to public education and that little country school as the symbol for accomplishing it. Thank you. Um, so changing topics dramatically um, now, we were approached by, uh, by a writer, the biographer of, of Gene Siebert, Gary McGee, uh, about telling Gene Siebert's story in a film. Now, Gene Siebert was born in 1938 in Marshalltown, Iowa, and at the age of five, she declared that when she grew up, she would be a movie star. Now, I had a couple of friends who did that when I was growing up, and I can promise you they didn't make good on that. But Gene Siebert did. In fact, she entered a competition, a worldwide talent search, um, for the new uh, auto parameters film, uh, St. Joan. She was chosen from among 18,000 applicants uh, for that film, kind of a, a vintage version of American Idol, I guess. She's best known as the, uh, around the world as the star of Jean-Luc Godard's French New Wave film, Breathless. And I think in America, we probably remember her best uh, in Painter Wagon with Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin, or perhaps in the film Lilith uh, with Warren Beatty and Peter Fonda. She, we just had the Golden Globe Awards, and Jean was nominated for, uh, as Best Actress uh, for Golden Globe Award for Lilith. But as we explore in the film itself, uh, Jean was equally um, interested in, and had a desire for social justice of all kinds. And this was something that started in her as that desire to be an actress did when she was a child. It was just a consistent uh, theme. It wasn't as if she became famous and became wealthy and then uh, acquired this interest. But, and for Jean, I think the thing that irritated her the most, uh, or that motivated her the most along these lines, was that someone might be treated differently uh, because of their race. When we get a chance to watch the clip, uh, you will see that Jean became involved uh, as an activist by donating money to a controversial uh, organization at the time. Um, everyone probably knows something about the uh, 
McCarthy hearings and, and those uh, things that went on, and especially as they pertain to the film industry uh, in the 1950s. But a lot of people don't know about a program that the FBI oh, yeah. instituted in um, the 60s called COINTELPRO, and Gene was targeted by that program. Okay, so 
that's just the trailer for that documentary, but it gives you the feel of what we were doing there, and really just letting these three young women tell, uh, each had a slightly different story about their experience uh, in sex trafficking. Uh, the film that was mentioned that we just premiered last Thursday is called Letters Home to Hero Street, and that film uh, tells the story of uh, just one man's experience, one of the eight heroes. We had access to about 130 letters that he wrote uh, beginning in 1942 when he was drafted into the U.S. Army, uh, and ending uh, about a month before he was killed uh, in Burma. We started a, a larger Hero Street project uh, perhaps three years ago, and we've had a great deal of difficulty raising uh, money for that project, and so it's just kind of been creeping along. But uh, the Illinois Arts Council approached WQPT, our PBS station here in town, with some funding, and because QPT has this emphasis on embracing our military, they wondered about the Hero Street project. It wasn't enough money to do the feature, and we had to have it done by the end of the year, and so we pitched this uh, shorter uh, project. Uh, telling this one man's story through his letters. This will be the trailer for that one. Yes. October 4th, 1942. Just a few lines to say hello and to hope that every one of you are all well as I am at the present time. Since from now on, just write on one side of the paper and watch what you write, because all mail will be censored. Is mother still crying? I hope not. Tell Ma not to worry, because it makes it harder for me. Christmas was just a memory in our minds, what you have in the States. Sometimes we don't even know what day of the week it is. Army don't stop for jungles, rain, mud, or otherwise. So he ceases to have no mercy for us. We have an idea where we're going, but I can't say it because it's military seat. So far, we don't know when the zero hour will come for us to move to the port of embarkation. Just pray God that we may come home and that this war will be over soon. I at this point put out to Josh Malenka. Josh, raise your hand. Pakistan student. He's in the film. He plays a uh, uh, Western Union uh, telegram uh, delivery person, and we appreciated working with Josh on this film. Um, the context for the Hero Street story has to do with uh, workers from Mexico being brought into uh, the Silva's train yards uh, during World War I when there was a shortage of manpower. It has to do with uh, those folks being housed in the train yard, in boxcars, uh, around the time of the Great Depression in the, the late 20s. Uh, local citizens decided they were living there tax-free and should be moved out of there. Uh, in some cases, some of those boxcars were moved up to what is now 2nd Street, which was a former dump site. Second Street was also the last street in the city of Silvis to be paved. Um, but this story about Hero Street springs out of that neighborhood, and the fact that this block and a half long in Silvis uh, has produced more veterans, U.S. military veterans, than any other street in America, well over 100 at this point, and has lost more uh, veterans in combat than any other street in America, a total of eight, six during World War II, and two during the Korean conflict. Well, now take a look at, if we have that ready, the trailer for Sons and Daughters of Thunder. Yeah, thank you. What is a slave?
project is our first attempt at a narrative film, a, a docudrama. And the story comes to us via a play with a, an Iowa playwright uh, from the neighborhood in Iowa. And uh, the story is about uh, the first public debates in the United States regarding the abolition of slavery. And they happened in a setting very much like this. On a college campus, it was a seminary. And they were organized by, by students, in particular by the student leader whose name was Theodore Well. Now, Theodore Well was, uh, in his day, perhaps the most famous abolitionist, but he kind of drifted out of the limelight later on, and we don't remember him as much now. But these debates were held at uh, Lane Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Harriet Beecher, she was not Harriet Beecher Stowe yet, uh, her father was the president of that seminary, and Harriet was exposed to this first debate. And uh, we believe it led her, uh, later on, among other things, to write uh, her best-selling book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, we were talking earlier about whether or not what you do has an effect, uh, a measurable effect. Uh, Theodore Weld went from town to town in, in a way, uh, like a traveling minister in a way, converting people to the idea of abolition, which was considered to be a kind of a, a radical notion in those days. Uh, and, he, and the abolitionists engaged in this over a period of perhaps 30 years before they saw real progress. And when Harriet's book was published, she had encapsulated in a novel form the message that these other people had been uh, delivering all along. But perhaps because people could read it in the privacy of their own home, and perhaps because it was, it was couched within uh, this uh, uh, drama, if you will, a fictional story, it touched people. And in fact, it turned the tide of public sentiment against uh, slavery and in favor of abolition. Harriet's book was, at the time of its in publication all over the world, the second best-selling book in the world after the Bible. So that was an example, I guess, of someone really uh, making a huge difference with one, one particular work. I don't know if anybody, oh, let me put this on and see if I don't. Can you hear me? Um, has anybody seen the documentary, How to Survive the Plague? Uh, it is a documentary which reveals the activism that arose in reaction to a system that was failing to do much to address the growing HIV epidemic and move the masses. And that is a film that actually had that kind of an impact. So when we're talking today about documentary films and uh, if they do impact social justice, um, I think there are a number of amazing documentaries that do that. We are much more on a smaller scale, but um, our documentary, 15-minute documentary, Any Kid Anywhere, that's an example of, of a project that can help young people become aware of the dangers of uh, sex trafficking and help victims to become stronger. So in our own way, we feel like we are making some kind of impact, informing people and making people aware of the past of these historical events that not a lot of people know about, but it's important to look back and to maybe not make those same mistakes again. Um, these, important, these stories are important to us, and I guess when we started out as documentary filmmakers, did we plan to make any kind of an impact on social change, or was our message supposed to be about social justice? I think in those early moments when we were starting out, I don't think that was the case. But I think as we started to dig and we started to research and we started to get into the heads of the people that we were studying, we realized that that was what we wanted to do. That we wanted to be a conduit for people's voices from the past, those who were gone, and to help make people wear those stories. So returning to the question that uh, the uh, session later will ask, does it do any good to have public symposiums? As with our films, we'll have to kind of wait and see, I guess. And sometimes we know uh, the effects they have and sometimes we don't. Will everyone who attends respond? Probably not. But we can always tell if we have a group, a large group, who watch one of our films, we can always tell that there's two or three people who see the world differently 
uh, because of the film they just watched. And so we, uh, we take some uh, comfort in knowing that we're reaching at least those two or three in that uh, specific way. So again, paraphrasing our highway friend's quote, social justice, I love those words. They sound so fair, but they're so hard to explain. What is social justice? How does that work? Uh, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. We have a few minutes, I think, if anyone has any questions, we would try to answer them about anything that you've seen. I'm so sorry about the movie star clip. Um, but we show that. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, question is, where are our films available? Uh, the ones that are currently in distribution are available um, on any online retailer, including the big ones, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, etc. A couple of our films are on Netflix, uh, Blisco Living with a Mystery, Lost Nation, The Highway. Uh, we're just now getting into the streaming biz uh, business, and we're streaming initially on Vimeo, and uh, later this year on Amazon.com. Uh, many of our films are also broadcast on a rotating basis on public television stations, primarily in the Midwest. Just by way of an audience, uh, this film that we just completed and premiered last Thursday, uh, we have an audience of about 500, a little over 500 that we premiere. But that audience, as it rolls out through public television stations across the country, by the end of the year, by December the 31st, and we don't know the exact number, but the number of viewers will be around half a million, between half a million million viewers. So uh, that sort of makes us crazy thinking about that, but um, that's the, the power of the medium. The film is also shown in film festivals and theaters and venues across the country as well. And the Highway film is in our library here. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. What's the most difficult part of the process of making a documentary? Is it the researching or is it the filming or the editing? It's the fundraising. <laughs> yeah, that's true, because if we spend two or three years uh, working on a particular project, we spend literally half of that time just chasing the funding, and it gets pretty discouraging sometimes, but uh, and it wouldn't be something that most people would, would want to do. The other, thing, the other thing I would say is difficult, or I wouldn't say difficult, but challenging, is trying to get the people that you are interviewing to trust you. They don't know what you're going to do with their material. And so it can be a very uh, intimidating, scary thing for them to be able to sit down and open up their story to you. And uh, I think one of the other challenging parts of that is sitting and trying not to become emotional because there are some very emotional moments um, as you're sitting and hearing stories. And uh, trying to be true to the material. Uh, Kelly and I, when we make a film, we let the material take us on the journey. And uh, our, the viewers, I guess what we are trying to accomplish is we want the viewers to take that journey with us. Um, it's really a whole process of discovery for us as filmmakers, and I guess that is kind of our approach um, when we get the films put together. Yes? Have you had a situation where maybe someone has approached you that they want you to do a documentary maybe with their particular viewpoint and maybe they're willing to fund it. Have you had a situation like that? Um, I, well, uh, I guess the Breaking Traffic Project was a situation like that. Um, but, but in that case, uh, there, were, there were parameters that we had to work with and that had to do with the running time and had to do with the people that we were going to interview. Uh, but, but the rest was sort of up to us to, to sort out, and then we worked on it together, of course, as we kind of refined it. Uh, for whatever reason, no one ever comes to us with money for the project. <laughs> we, we have had a couple of instances where we've had people come to us and pitch an idea for a documentary um, that we knew we couldn't ethically get involved in. There have been a couple of moments like that. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for your attention today. We appreciate it.